Good morning, everyone. I'm here today with um, Luisa from Citrus Luxury Travel in Malta and Louise from the Corinthia Palace in Malta. We are going to showcase the wonderful island of Malta that um, I have learned about over the last um, two years. It is a great destination to go to, quieter um, than other parts of Europe. So if you've been to Europe many times and you want to go to a little unknown place that is getting more popular because it is quieter, um, I welcome you guys. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having us, Dobby. We're really excited to be here. Yes, thank you. So first, um, Luis is going to talk about um, Citrus luxury, luxury Travel and how um, her company in Malta can help you discover the whole island. Thank you very much, Darby. So, uh, as you said, Malta is our little Mediterranean gem, still quite undiscovered by the US market. We are bang in the center of the Mediterranean islands. And I'm happy to say that our travel agency, Citrus, is a one-stop shop for any client. So we do leisure groups, leisure FITs, could be three, four-star hotels. Um, uh, we also do mice groups quite a bit and the luxury segment, which is my segment. And I'm going to be presenting Luxury Malta. So our little gem in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea really is the place to be because it is not only sun and sea that you expect from an island destination. It's also a very historical island. Being bang in the middle of the Mediterranean, you can only imagine what type of powers and who passed our waters from east to west, north to south. They all had a little piece of Malta and they've all left a little piece of themselves behind. Yes, sounds amazing. <laughs> so, as you can imagine, getting to Malta, you have to get to us either by flight or by sea. There's no driving from mainland Europe to, to our destination. We are very close to everywhere in Europe, around an hour and a half away from everywhere, Athens, Rome, three hours away from London. So it's very, very easy. It's almost like catching the bus, I'd like to say. So, of course, I skip right on to dining in Malta. <laughs> let oh, let, let me talk a little bit about the destination first. <laughs> um, uh, Malta has over 7,000 years of history. Um, uh, we have the oldest freestanding temples in the world. We actually have two main languages. That is why I'm talking in such fluent English. One of them is being English, since we were a British colony, of course. And the other is Maltese. The Maltese language comes from very, very old Phoenician times here. It is a Semitic language based on the Arabic language. So it sounds very harsh, although we're very friendly as a nation. Mm -hmm. The numbers, if I have to tell you the numbers, we had snake, lita, erba, hamsa, sounds very Arabic. Oh, but definitely it does. If Luisa sees me in the morning, I will tell her, bonjour. bonjour. <laughs> Which sounds oh. like Italian. Or grazie, grazie in Maltese. So it is really a melting pot of, of different um, uh, cultures, even in our cooking, as the slide says. Our, our cuisine is very Mediterranean, mainly based on tomatoes and herbs, like the rest of, of, uh, of the Mediterranean cuisine. Having said that, we offer a little bit of everything, and I'm very guilty to say that I enjoy my spot of sushi on the weekend. Oh, nice. Actually quite have quite a few um, uh, Asian restaurants. You can find a good burger as well. So it really is um, uh, a melting pot of different cuisines here. Sunday, I like to have my roast beef and potatoes, very British. That's one trade they left here. 
So, you know, family lunches on a Sunday tend to be quite the traditional roast. Oh, nice. And what is like a traditional Maltese dish? Well, there's a snack that is called pastizzi, which is basically phyllo pastry with ricotta or mushy peas in the middle. That's our little snack. You can get a pastizzi for about um, 50 cents from the street. And uh, something a little bit more decadent is um, rabbit stew. Something okay. that we'd, we'd normally eat on a Sunday. Of course, if you go to a Maltese restaurant, it's not only going to be the only dish on the menu. Right. The Maltese dishes are very easy, very easy to eat. So if they're not, if your clients are not so keen on rabbit, then um, there's definitely something Maltese that they can try and like. I'm being oh, a tiny island, we're surrounded by sea. So we obviously have a lot of fresh fish and octopus would also be another traditional dish a stew of octopus, and we have our local um, fish, the lampuka, the which, mahi-mahi. You know it as okay. a big mahi-mahi? Yeah. Nice. For us, it's the little it's Very small. Yeah. Okay, great. In 2020, um, uh, Michelin Guide Malta was, um, um, was created, and since then, we have five Michelin star restaurants on the island, and one of them is actually in Louise's hotel, should be opening in a couple of days now, oh, which great. is very exciting. Yes, but, it's very exciting. Which is a personal favorite of mine, if I, say, if I must say. If you're looking to go off the beaten path in Malta, we definitely suggest meeting our Maltese cook, Pippa. Pippa is very well known on our island. Uh, her character is larger than life. And we like to organize cooking classes and then a nice Maltese meal in her Mediterranean garden. But before that, if you want, she can take you down to the local farmer's market and you can haggle like a Maltese person oh, and nice. get your, your fresh produce at a very good rate. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Looks like a great authentic um it no, is a very authentic experience, experience which, is, which is what we really specialize in here, Darby. I mean, you can get your cookie cutter itineraries that you find anywhere on the internet. But um, with us at Citrus, we really try to steer away from, you know, the normal tourist traps. Of course, we're not going to take you away from, um, uh, from Valletta and Mdina, which are right. super highlights on right. the island, but we're definitely going to show you the, we're going to make you integrate more with the locals. Let's just say that. Right. You'll leave us a great. true Malteser. <laughs> um, unmissable sites, of course, I just mentioned our capital city of Valletta. Valletta is all a UNESCO World Heritage Site built by the Knights of St. John. The Knights of St. John were given Malta. Um, uh, Lou, would you like to take it from here? Sure, of course. course. A little bit of overview on, on, on our knights who left us with so much beautiful uh, history and architecture wherever you look. So many people know of the Templar Knights, the Knights mm -hmm. of St. John arrived in Maltam in 1530. They actually had been fighting in Jerusalem and were thrown out of Jerusalem. They moved to Rhodes. They were thrown out of Rhodes uh, by the Ottoman Empire. And then they were given Malta. But when they arrived, Malta was just barren land. It was rock. No diamonds, no coffee, no fortifications, no castles, no palaces. The knights were sons of the princes of Europe. They were lords, they were barons, they were used to magnificent palaces. So they didn't mm -hmm. really want the destination. The only reason they accepted it was the location. Malta strategically, as Luisa correctly said at the beginning, in the center of the Mediterranean, making it the best location to attack you know, the East and steal all the booty and all the jewels from the right. Ottoman Empire. Also, the Knights of St. John were religious. They were Roman Catholic. So they were protecting the religion, the Catholic flag. In fact, the Pope wanted the Knights to be based in Malta because they, he knew that if they were based there, they would protect the northern part and Europe. 
from the attacks from the Ottoman Empire. So they were stationed in Burgu. Burgu was one of the harbors, a city just by the harbor. They were stationed there. But then in 1565, the Ottoman Empire did get to the destination. And we had the Great Siege, a battle that lasted for months. Throughout the bloodiest war of history, they say. Oh, wow. We had, you know, heads catapulted across the harbor, bodies thrown across the harbor on crosses. It was, <laughs> it, it was brutal, but it did leave a very beautiful sight for the future guests. Of right. Yeah. Um, when your clients are sailing in on a cruise or even just a, a sunset sail around the island, we definitely recommend coming, waking up if you're coming in at five o'clock in the morning with your cruise liner or just watching the entrance into the, into the Grand Harbour, which is a, a large natural harbour in Malta. Um, the beauty of it is it is all fortified. It is the battlefield of the Great Siege. So it's, it's like sailing back in time. It really is a spectacular sight. It's to all, see there's nothing like yeah, it. Yeah, all white Globigerina limestone. Mm -hmm. I think these walls were built by men with no proper tools, no machinery, you know. It was all handmade in the hot sun. It took years to be built, but it's, as Louisa said, it's a sight of credible. It's yeah, it's great to have the history kind of behind what you're seeing so that, you know, you can get a sense of kind of being back in time there. Definitely, definitely. And that's where Valletta is located, our, our capital city, which is all a UNESCO World Heritage Site. What can you find in, in, inside, um, uh, inside the walls of Valletta? We have the St. John's Co-Cathedral is our crown jewel. From the outside, it is a, well, a very Baroque looking building, plain, symmetrical, very subtle. But as soon as you walk in the doors, mm. it's like being slapped in the face with beauty, really. Amazing. Gold gilded ceilings with Mattia Preti, um, uh, frescoes, um, marble tombstones that adorn the whole floor. In fact, it's called the most beautiful floor in the world. And to add to this beauty, the, there are two Caravaggio paintings uh, in the oratory. One being the most important painting that the, that the painter has painted. It is a life-size painting of the beheading of St. John, and it's actually signed by the, the artist. It's the oh, only amazing. painting that he signed himself. Where else to go while you're here? Like Louise mentioned, the three cities, this is the first, uh, the first area where the knights settled. So you can see how humble they were at the very beginning. Small little houses, winding streets, because of course in those times you used to try and um, uh, uh, shield yourself with the, with the mm -hmm. winding buildings instead of large walls. It's very quaint, very lovely to just walk around, get lost. Um, and then you see the transition to Valletta, where they got a little bit more cocky with big palaces and auberges. You wouldn't even believe that they were supposed to live like paupers these nights. Okay. <laughs> like I said, we have the oldest freestanding temples in the world, older than Stonehenge, older than the Pyramids of Giza. They're dotted around Malta and Gozo, the sister island of Malta which is reached two ways. Um, Malta is a very, very small island. You can get from one, uh, one tip of the island to the other in 45 minutes via the main road. Okay. So it's very easy to get around. It's like for me to go to Boston without exactly. traffic. No. <laughs> Um, uh, and to get to Goza, there are two ways. You can, you can get on the fast ferry from Valletta. So if you're wandering around the city of Valletta and say, hey, I feel like going for a meal to Gozo, it's only 45 minutes away by ferry. Or you can take the scenic route, drive up to the tip of the island, and then take a 25-minute ferry over to Gozo. Okay. And that's where you'll find more history very tranquil island. I would say um, 
it's like Malta around 60 years ago. It's okay. rural, it's full of farmland and wineries. It's lovely. Louisa mentioned uh, the prehistoric temples. If you do have clients who are interested in prehistory, so we have around 26 prehistoric sites. That doesn't mean we have 26 prehistoric temples, but we do have one underground burial site. That's the Hypergeum. That's a highlight Louisa can always get tickets for. It's a very exclusive experience. So uh, only 10 people at a time can go down per hour. Just oh, amazing. To maintain the, 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 the beauty and um, obviously not damage the site. Right. Because That's wonderful. it is literally like, I'm going to repeat it again, like walking back in time. You can actually see the frescoes that were painted thousands of years ago. It's unbelievable. And it's underground. So it's like looking at a temple above ground, but this is rock hewn. It's cut out of the rock. Once again, no tools, no machinery, all done by hand underground. Wow, it's amazing. It really is. It really is. Like Louise was saying, here's a, a, li a little sneak peek of the, the hypogeum, um, dating back to 3500 BC. It was, it was a burial site. It wasn't actually a, a temple, what, what our archaeologists say at the moment. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, but it helps explain and understand how the temples were eventually built. Because the temples above land were damaged by the rain, by you know, eroding, by construction. Just right. by the elements. And by the elements. You could actually understand what they looked like from the rock cut uh, burial site because it's a mirror image, but beneath the ground. Yes, it's perfectly oh, amazing. Neat. So going back to what we can do for you, like we were saying, we can organize an array of exclusive experiences, experiences to really integrate with Maltese life, like tasting the, the flavors of the land, meeting mm -hmm. a beekeeper and tasting his honey. Malta is very known for their honey. In fact, during the Roman reign in Malta, it was called melite, honey in oh, okay. uh, in their language. And the Emperor Cicero used to make his empire come down to Malta to steal the jars of honey because the Maltese honey was more renowned than Italian honey. Oh, so there's okay. fightings that 40 huge jars of Maltese honey were stolen to taken up to Italy. Oh, great. Yes. And you can do also high tea with nobility or just go around their private palace with a glass of Prosecco on your hand, meet the true knight of Malta who lives atop one of the forts of Malta, the Fort St. Angelo. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have any noble knights in the US wanting to meet one of their own, yes. we have Fra <laughs> Chrétien here as well, who's willing to meet them. We also do adventure activities like off-road biking in the countryside, trekking, as you can imagine with, multi, with the Maltese blue azure waters. We can do kayaking, sailing, going on a luxury yacht, you name it. Dobby, Luisa's taken me kayaking to a marvelous uh, cavern. Sunken cave. Yes, it was unbelievable. I mean, she woke me up really early in the morning. And <laughs> when it's calm, could, right? And they picked up a little picnic basket and we kayaked together. We weren't really in sync at the beginning. I think we were having a few problems, but by the end of it, we came out yeah. pros from this. We okay. got there in the end. We got there. So tell the me, end. like the beaches, are they rocky in the water? Like, is it, what's the temperature? Most of the beaches of most of the sandy beaches are found in the northern part of the island. Okay. Having said that, I really don't think that Malta is a beach destination. Beach destination. Right. Okay. Because the Maltese love the beach themselves. Mm -hmm. And usually our small beaches are packed with people. Right. So, yes, if you do like swimming, there are many rocky beaches around Malta. But if you like the sand and want to enjoy, your own space on the sand, then I think Malta should come as a as an 
escape from that. <laughs> right, right. Okay, great. You know, That's like, good to know. And the culture is so rich. You come to Malta for the culture and history. Yeah, definitely. Then if you yeah. want one day of beach, Louisa can book a private um, of course, beach club of for course. them. Right. Then yeah, and then you have the water, right? Private you know, like beach water or, activity. Exactly. Private beach club or, or, or yacht, right. whatever, whatever right. you prefer. Um, the temperature, as you were asking, we have nice hot summers. Um, oh, Fahrenheit, would, would you know it? No. In, in degrees Celsius, the, the seawater goes up to 20, 30 degrees Celsius, but I don't know that in Fahrenheit, I'm afraid. We'll yeah, I'm not really sure it either. It's warmer though, it's not too, it's not too cool. So no, 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 no. It's it's nice and warm. I would say it mimics the the temperature of Greek water. Okay, great. Okay. Um, if if you enjoy uh, snorkeling or diving, we also have fantastic diving sites. Malta is very known for its wrecks here. Some of the most popular dive sites. Oh, Just nice. About 82, 82 degrees. 82 or 83 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty warm. Yeah. Well, for for my for where I am in New England, that's warm water. So that's great. Yes, it's it is really lovely to just soak after a hard day's work. Of course, when you're on, on vacation, it's a little bit <laughs> right. Hard. But we definitely enjoy it in the summer after a hard day's work. Yes. So Malta sticks to, to its traditions very strongly. Um, in this slide, you can see um, a village feast going on. The Maltese people are very religious. We're 92% Roman Catholic here. Okay. Having said that, we are very, very liberal and we are top of the rainbow index for um, uh, LGBTQ plus rights. Mm -hmm. um, Every village has a parish church in the center and every parish church celebrates their patron saint. So how do the Maltese celebrate their patron saint? Of course, with a large street party. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, a lot of lovely decorations, bands going out in the street and playing music. It's very, very lively. In the evening, we light up the skies with fireworks, beautiful fireworks that can be seen from many, many areas of Malta, especially Louise's Hotel. Since it is right in the center, you can see what's happening in the night sky all around you. Nice. And in summer, of course, lucky for us, most of these festivals take place. So it is full of energy during the summer months. Great. As I was saying, LGBTQ itineraries, we are actually part of IGLTA here in Malta, the organization um, uh, that stamps us for being accepting for LGBTIQ plus uh, clients. Great. We celebrate our Pride Week in September. And mm -hmm. in 2023, we're going to have a Euro Pride, which is a very, very large party uh, that celebrates Pride. Celebrity spotting in Malta, believe it or not, we've filmed loads of very well-known um, movies here, very well-known blockbusters like Gladiator, mm -hmm. like Captain Phillips. Captain Phillips was filmed in our very large water tank at Fortranella, also in the Grand Harbor. Oh, nice. Assassin's Creed, Troy, By the Sea, Brad and Angelina absolutely love Malta and love Gozo even more. Mm -hmm. Quite a few. And Game of Thrones season one, which we like to um, uh, um, base a movie tour around. Oh, very nice. So how do you get around? We are very Mediterranean when we drive. I, <laughs> we drive on the wrong side of the road. So we always suggest leave getting around in our hands. Don't right. try and drive here. Of course, we can always organize renting a car, mm -hmm. but um, uh, booking transfers is, is essential when you're in Malta, especially during the summer months. Right, so much nicer to have someone that 
Yes, you know, definitely. The guy, they can tell you what that is on the side of the road. The Get more they can carry exactly. you from one place to another. Then when you're on vacation, you need to feel right. like you're on vacation. Exactly. Driving around is stressful. So. Yes, yes. Communication, like I was telling you, we have two official languages, one being Maltese, the other being English. So it is very easy to communicate with everyone uh, you meet in, in Malta because we all speak English. We, we are also part of the European Union since mm -hmm. 2004. So we have the European currency, the euro. So wherever you're, wherever you're going around in Europe, you can just hop on down to Malta. There's no need to change currencies and whatnot. Okay. Of mm -hmm. course, bringing me to my one of my last slides, luxury accommodation. Um, with Citrus Luxury, you can, you can be sure that we're going to recommend the best uh, accommodation that suits your client's needs. We'll make sure that the hoteliers go over and above for your clients. <laughs> they know that when they see our name behind it, that your clients are very, very special and important. Right. And for myself as the travel advisor, you know, having um, you guys in destination, you know, I know my clients are being taken care of so that, you know, anything that arises, they need something extra, you know, you guys will be there to help them. You know, since I'm, you know, many hours away in another time zone. Definitely, definitely. We're there every step of the way. I mean, we, we offer a very personalized product. We try and meet each and every client who visits the island. We give them our telephone number just in case they need anything. But usually our guides and drivers are more than capable of taking care, especially the hoteliers. Right. Who are so happy to help and so friendly. So now I will say thank you and leave the Corinthia um, uh, segment to Louise. Thank so, you, Lisa. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if you know much about the Corinthia, but Corinthia as a brand did start in Malta. And the name Corinthia originates from the columns you find on the outside of the hotel where I work. Oh, nice. uh, it was the original first Corinthia hotel in the world and it originated in Malta. Corinthia is a Maltese brand. It belongs to the Pisani family, a Maltese family. It actually started out as a restaurant. And then after two years, they realized the potential of this building, this marvelous building, which you see in the picture here. And they expanded and built a five-star hotel. Funnily enough, the hotel was opened up by Prince Philip and Sir Roger Moore. And it has remained a five-star hotel ever since the day. Mm -hmm. So this is the main restaurant of our hotel. It's known as the villa because it actually was a, a villa. It was the residence of an important magistrate, Magistrate Refalo. So in history books, you will find this as Ref, Villa Refalo. Uh, the magistrate even had his own train station at the back of his villa. See how oh. important he was. We are located right in the center of the island. Louisa mentioned how easy it is to get to the island. I will tell you from our hotel, it's really easy to discover the destination because mm -hmm. we're bang in the middle, eight kilometers away from the uh, from Valletta, the capital city, six kilometers away from the airport, you know, 11 kilometers away to get the ferry to go so you know, another seven kilometers away for a sandy beach, five kilometers away from Imdina. So really short distances. We're just talking about a few minutes here and there. Mm. So it's an ideal location if you want to be based in one hotel and not have to keep changing hotels to, to you know, to mm -hmm. discover the entire island. Definitely. Right. The island is small enough to just base yourself in one hotel and just move around right. as you will. It's a very residential area, wonderful villas all around. There are a lot of embassy residences, including the American embassy residence. And the American embassy is in the uh, village just up the road as well. Okay. So they'll feel right at home. Right. Our next door neighbor happens to be the president because the president's residence, the president's palace lies behind the trees in the image. These are our grounds. So this is what you'd see from your hotel window. 
Malta is not a green country. Having said that, our hotel is in a very green location. And this is because a grandmaster back in the past, back in the 17th century, decided to build himself a country home, a country palace surrounded by luscious gardens. Oh, nice. So this is our hotel. We have a total of 140 rooms right now. Um, it is a five-star hotel. And I'd say it's got a very classical feel, very soft tones, mm, very, very relaxing, lovely. large spaces. And we found that during COVID, many guests enjoyed coming to our hotel because it's not a huge hotel. It's not one of these modern big places. Mm -hmm. It's small in number of bedrooms, but has large landscape land. So people have the space to be alone if they wish to do mm -hmm. so. Great. All our bedrooms, this is our standard room, all our bedrooms have a large balcony verging onto a terrace. So everyone gets to enjoy outdoor space. We have 300 days of sunshine in Malta. So let's make the most of being outdoors. Yes, definitely. I mean, this is one of our larger suite bedrooms and this has a huge terrace. And actually we will be renovating all the bedrooms of the hotel starting from quarter four. So to be honest, these images are not what you're going to expect should your clients come to Malta next year. But this year, this is what they'll get. Spacious. So very welcoming and calming and just like peaceful. Exactly. That's what the hotel, that's the aura of the hotel. Mm. It's very homey. Yes. Nice marble in the bathrooms too. This is our main restaurant. So this is where clients come for breakfast. All the rooms at the side are laid out for lunch or afternoon tea or dinner. So our main restaurant is the villa, but we also have outdoor dining. We have an Asian restaurant called the rickshaw. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the Caprice bar for anyone who'd fancy a nightcap. Outdoor drinks in the summer months too. We have an executive club. So guests in our executive uh, rooms or suites have uh, entry to the executive club for free afternoon tea amenities, uh, sunset cocktail drinks in the evening, their own little space to get away. If clients do want a meeting room, you know, for a quick meeting, or maybe they'd like to have a little function, like it's a family and they want to celebrate the 60th anniversary. We've got mm -hmm. plenty of space to do that too. But the speciality of the hotel is the beautiful, luscious gardens, the swimming pool area. It really is an oasis in the Mediterranean. And like you said, Darby, it's calm, it's right. neutral, you know, it's relaxing. Mm -hmm. And you're still there with the ancient history, too, since the building's older and has, you know, all the history behind it, too. So and I, the location sounds wonderful just to be able to explore you know, and have one home base to, you know, be able to go to the, to the letter, to go to the, out on the water for the day, or just, you know, explore the other, you know, ancient ruins and things like that. It's amazing. And then after a tough day out exploring, why not come back to our marvelous spa? Mm. We have a stunning spa using S-Spa products. So it's a marvelous indoor pool. We also have a private vitality suite. So if guests feel scared being near other guests, they can rent out the vitality area for themselves. Oh, nice. We have a serenity lounge where guests will sit down and do their consultation prior to any of the treatments they book. And what's wonderful about our spa is you don't book a treatment, you book time. And then when you get to the spa, you can say, oh, today I fancy a massage. Oh, today I'd rather have a facial. All our therapists can handle any of the treatments available in the oh, spa because nice. they are spa trained. We have a marvelous state-of-the-art gym, brand new equipment, looking out to the garden. So you're running on that treadmill, sweating, but still looking at the trees. And then one of our new outlets, this opened last summer in August, Josephine's. Josephine's is our plant-based uh, restaurant. So all the cakes, all the salads, all the sandwiches are all vegan. So if you have any clients with strict requirements, Josephine's is an ideal uh, outlet oh, for them. But we also specialize in coffee here. We've got the British Origins coffee, which is just marvelous. It's a higher scale coffee and 
I mean, I just love the marble in this bath, to be honest. Mm. I just want to steal the marble. Yeah, it's so gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> the waiter is not bad as well. <laughs> he makes a marvelous cappuccino. Yeah. And this is our really exciting uh, news. Bahia. Bahia will be opening in February. Bahia originated in Lia, which is a small Michelin restaurant in the sister village. But what's happening is uh, they've grown in size. The demand for Bahia is, keeps them consistently growing. So they've decided to move into our hotel, have taken a floor of our hotel, and we will be having the largest Michelin restaurant on the island. We'll take okay. 85 patrons. Nice. We'll have a private dining room for 12 people, and there are two outdoor terraces for outdoor dining too. These are just some renderings of the place, but... We'll have the photos any day now. Nice. So that's it from me. If you'd like to reach out to us, there's the details there, Darby. And thank you very, very much. <laughs> yes, thank you both. This was a wonderful, you know, exploration of Malta. And I can't wait to, you know, get my clients back over to Europe more. Um, you know, we're getting closer and closer to people really wanting to travel far. And, you know, I know Malta has um, been somewhat secluded during this time. And, you know, it's great to have a place to be able to send clients to that just want, you know, a little bit off the beaten path that they, um, you know, can explore something completely different and, you know, feel comfortable in their exploration. So I thank you. Louisa and Louise for joining me today and sharing your um, wonderful hotel and your wonderful island with us. And I look forward to um, sending clients to you guys soon. We look forward to hosting them. And yourself, Darby, we have to get you over. I know, believe me, that has been on my mind. I'm like, okay, get my kids off to college. <laughs> I will be on my way. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. It was nice to see you both. Thank you, Darby. It was really nice to see you too, Darby. See you soon. Okay, take care.